After a lifetime of researching the dynamic and enigmatic world of light entertainment, I've decided to ditch my notebook and meet the people who inspire me. What makes them the people they are? How do they feel about the show business landscape in which they find themselves? And in a world where anyone can be a star, is there still a need for performers who have universal appeal? Come with me on a journey of discovery as I get a unique insight into Britain's favourite stars with a little help from my glamorous assistants. Yeah, well, I say glamorous, more like hazardous. And of course, we'll have a bit of fun along the way. To say Jonathan Maitland has had a varied career is an understatement of massive proportion. A stalwart of current affairs for both the BBC and ITV, Maitland has been involved in every aspect of news presentation and has witnessed the rise of 24-hour role in news broadcasting. Yet what makes Jonathan unique is his ability to see the alternative side of current affairs and no greater example of this is his new stage play, Dead Sheep, surrounding the trials and tribulations of the Thatcher government. I got up with Jonathan to talk news, television and of course the Iron Lady. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr Jonathan Maitland. So, first question... What first inspired you to do what you do, and who are your TV heroes? I suppose what led me into it was um, wanting to do something that used my brain, but also enabled me to show off, because I had a performing gene. And I did a law degree, and I think, like Alistair, was lined up to do law, wasn't he? And... When I was at university, just down the road from here, doing law, I went to an evening for barristers, trainee barristers, and they're all dressed up wearing wigs and doing these weird chants and toasts. And I just thought it was like the Freemasons and thought, I hate this. This is like working for the man, you know. So I thought I want to do anything but the law. There was a gene in me that said do anything but law it's too rigid and then I saw an article in the Evening Standard with a picture of some ITN trainees funny enough given that Alistair works for ITN and it said that these graduates had got a training course with ITN and they'd paid them to learn how to be TV news reporters and I thought that's it so what inspired me was a small article in the Evening Standard because I just thought that's exactly what I want to do And from there, I got into the BBC as a local radio trainee reporter and carried on from there. In terms of my TV heroes, no one really springs to mind. I mean, there's lots of people on the television I can't stand. I mean, I think primarily TV is there for you to swear at and get annoyed by. So I can't stand most people on the television, including myself. I mean, just, just... If I think of anyone, I'll tell you later, but basically no one. These are testing times for public service broadcasting. In your opinion, what are the main incentives for the public to save the BBC? There is no incentive for the public to save the BBC. The BBC should be scrapped, or at least the the basis on which it's funded should be scrapped. It's a 20th century organisation struggling to survive in the 21st. It produces a lot of good programmes. There's one huge problem with it. And that is that we don't have a choice whether or not we pay for it. Yes, it's good value. Yes, it does lots of good stuff. Yes, it's arguably irreplaceable. Yes, it does sometimes what other people don't do. But there's a free market out there now and you can get anything that's on the BBC somewhere else, arguably apart from the radio. If it went subscription, I'd pay double for it and most of its problems would be solved overnight. Scrap it. Streaming and online services have become an increasingly integral part of how people consume their entertainment. Mm-hmm. What impact do you think that has on the preservation of television? Well, I suppose I you know, refer the judge and jury to my previous answer, which is that there is so much content out there now with radio, TV, online. I mean, it's a tsunami of content. And, you know, the whole world is in flux. And the big thing about a free market of content is you choose what you pay for. Um, So the biggest impact will be on the BBC, I think, because sooner or later the argument for the licence fee will be completely unjustifiable, even though it's, you know, in many ways brilliant, the BBC. Um, And the effect on 
TV. I mean, sooner or later, there's going to be a contraction, isn't there? I mean, if I could give you a definitive answer to that, I'd be a very, very, very rich person. Um, I mean, there's just there's just freaking oceans and planets and galaxies of content now. I was lucky because I started kind of in the golden age, really, in mid eighties, when there wasn't that much content and got into TV just as it was starting to really explode. Um, but, you know, it's, it's the Wild West now. It's all to play for, you know. I mean, BBC, ITV will still be around in 10, 20 years' time, but Lord knows what it'll look like. I, su I suspect more repeats, fewer kind of just some, you know, big ticket items. I can't see the BBC will try and just do 24-hour, round-the-clock services like it does now. It's already starting to pair back. I suppose sport will still be very massive because it's the one thing that is unpredictable and communal, isn't it, that plays out in real time. You've been associated with the satirical comic Chris Morris. In your opinion, why do you think his work isn't as celebrated as others of his generation? Well, I think it is. I would disagree with you there, Josh. I think Chris is, um, is loved and revered and feared and respected and admired. They did a top 50 comedy films of all time the other year on Channel 4. I think um, Four Lions came in at something like number 21. So that's pretty good to have the most, 21st most successful comedy film of all time. I invested in it and I'm still getting, you know, royalties every year. So he's very successful. And uh, you ask any people in the business about him and they'll, you know, they'll probably get too reverential and too over the top. But if you're saying, why isn't he in the same bracket as, say, Michael McIntyre or Victoria Wood, that's very easy. It's because he's completely uncompromising and he's got a very kind of dark, intelligent, cynical, some would say, very moral take on his work. And he's not very mainstream, but he's special and he's a great guy and he's very talented. Your new play, Dead Sheep, looks at the rise and fall of Margaret Thatcher's Tory cabinet in the 80s. Why did you think this was the right time to tell the story? Uh, it's not that new. It was two years ago. Uh, but it's just been on a national tour last year. Um, I thought it was the right time for two reasons. Number one, the right time now is always the right time to tell a really good story. And that's a really good story. And the story was never told properly in all the Margaret Thatcher films because it's the story of Margaret Thatcher and Geoffrey Howe and how Geoffrey supposedly, inverted commas, betrayed her. And it's an incredible story of politics and personalities. Incredible. So it's always the right time to tell a story if it's a good story. And secondly, politically, it was very relevant because it was about, guess what, Brexit and Europe. And you may have noticed that Brexit and Europe is a little bit in the news at the moment. So, plenty of good reasons to write a play about Europe. Steve Nallon is reprising his role as the Iron Lady in the play. Mm. Why do you think his portrayal of her proved so popular? He's an amazing actor. He has the voice unbelievably off pat. Um, he's got... The, Mrs Thatcher had kind of various voices she had a kind of early 80s voice and a late 80s voice he can do both unbelievably one's a bit more shrill than the other he's got a movement off pat he's just incredible um he's the best person for the role thinking retrospectively about the way that the thatcher tory government was portrayed on the satirical sketch show spitting image how close do you think it was to the real thing i think in good satire there's always a grain of truth isn't there and uh, it was by no means a documentary. It was heightened reality, wasn't it? And did she treat the cabinet like vegetables? Uh, arguably, yes. I mean, there's that famous sketch where was it she ordered steak and chips and the waiter says, what about the vegetables? And they say, uh, oh, they'll have what I'm having, um, which is quite funny. And she was like that with Geoffrey Howe. She used to humiliate him in public and be really rude and call him, what was it, she used to say, twaddle, that's twaddle, Geoffrey. Um, 
so yeah had had you know an element a core element of truth in it and uh, and it was great i mean it's very much of its time and they've tried to reheat it but i i'm not sure it's reheatable in this day and age but yeah it had a lot of truth about it what effect has rolling news had on uk journalism is there such thing as a slow news day cool that's a good question it's had a huge effect on on politics 24 news because the politicians have become kind of prisoners of the 24 hour news cycle and they react a lot quicker to things because they know the press are going to pick up on it and so events move a lot more quickly and they become more careful because they know that every utterance is going to be picked up on and examined and you know picked over and the chance of them making a gaffe that's embarrassing are greatly magnified because there's so many more people and outlets out there waiting to swoop on everything they say. Um, it's effect on the journalism, I think it's kind of diminished it a bit, really, because I think there's less time to absorb and think about the big things. When there's a 24-hour news beast to feed, it's very easy to go down blind alleys, and, and so there's a, a kind of atomization, if you like, of the news agenda. And instead of the really big stuff, where people are thoughtful and concentrate on it. You know, you get distracted by the day-to-day, -day, the hour-to-hour -hour news thing. I mean, there's a great quote about the news. And people watch the news thinking it's going to tell them what's going on in the world. But a guy called Ben Hecht, who was a director and a journalist, said, trying to find out what is going on in the world by watching the news or reading the papers is like trying to tell the time by looking at the ticking hand of a clock. It doesn't tell you that much. It's just a distraction. And so it, it has a kind of pettifying uh, influence, if that's a word. You know what I mean? It makes it more petty and less important. You know, so we all go bonkers because, you know, uh, this third item in the Labour manifesto is something that they want to do that's not going to happen anyway. Well, actually, which is quite important, but something, you know, arguably even less important you know, will rise up the agenda. Is there such a thing as a slow news day? I mean, that's a really good question. I mean, it depends on what your definition of news is. I mean, there are days where clearly there are no big stories. And so stuff that doesn't seem that important, you know, which will be, say, a, a report by a think tank, you know, will become a a big story. Um, so there's there are certainly days where what isn't that big or important a story will seem like it is because you always have to have a lead story and sometimes the lead story is massive i.e. 9-11 uh, or a tsunami that kills 250,000 people and sometimes it's just a, a poxy little report that really isn't that important I mean arguably you know there's this big debate about fake news but you know I, I would contend that most news by definition is fake I mean for instance the lead story today is that Trump has sacked the head of the FBI that's quite a big deal but actually, in Iraq or Afghanistan, probably someone's been blown up by a car bomb. A hundred people have probably died in a car bomb. Well, which is more important? You know, it's, it's, it's the Iraq thing. But, you know, that doesn't even get reported. So that, to me, makes the news, by definition, pretty fake. Um, so, yes, there are slow news days. Um, and the problem is that it because of the way news is, there has to be news. It just exaggerates smaller stories that wrote, don't really deserve to be leading the bulletin. Looking back over your career, what's your proudest achievement? I once did a story for Watchdog when I was uh, just reporting on it, where I wanted to do a piece about the ridiculous rules, dress codes on golf courses, which I just thought were pathetic. Because they, I don't know if you know this, but they all they in the 90s and still now you know they're always looking for stuff to you know stop you playing you know like you, you can't wear jeans you can't wear t-shirt you can't wear this you can't wear that there was a club near me that banned various items of clothing so i turned up with a pair of antlers on my head and a leather miniskirt and started playing and we filmed it 
using a, a secret camera and uh, this bloke started having a go at me he said you you can't play on this course and I said why not and he said well antlers and miniskirt we don't allow it I said well where's the where's the sign that says you don't allow it? where's the sign that says no antlers and no miniskirt I said you banned everything else you banned socks of a certain length you banned shorts you banned t-shirts you ban everything but you don't ban antlers and leather miniskirts so I'm going to carry on playing if you don't mind so we put it and he threatened to wrap his club around my head oh we became quite good friends after that actually um yeah that was my proudest moment um because it was anti-establishment and anti-bureaucratic and it was funny and I just hate I hate rules and the system I mean you know I know we generally have to you know it's like golf is supposedly one of the biggest participation sports in the world so why did they do anything they can to stop you participating it's just pardon my language can I swear yeah. it's fucking snobbery and I hate that I hate that so yeah and it went out and uh, it was funny it was good actually Chris liked it Chris Morris liked it very much he used to play it to his, his, his producers and say this is how you use a secret camera this is funny <laughs> so what's next for Jonathan Layton Right now, I'm going to go to Islington and see a play called The Treatment. Um, but I'm pretty much done with TV, or rather, TV is pretty much done with me because I'm a fat, middle-aged, pale, male and stale has-been. And I'm fine about that because I think you have to kind of... I mean, I admire I mean, I can't believe it. Alistair's still going at his age and good luck to him, but I'm bored by it. It's bored by me. It's a young person's game. It requires a lot of energy. I've gone as far as I'm going to go in radio and TV, which is, you know, really quite far. I've, I've done well. And I've had a good career. Uh, but I'm not going to waste my time and energy putting in programme ideas that get rejected. I mean, it's, you know, I'm not going to turn to Alan Partridge. It's pathetic. You know, sending in an idea saying, you know, you know, monkey tennis with Jonathan Maitland. I mean, it's just, who wants that? Uh, but I'm going to carry on writing plays because I enjoy it. And I want to get better at it. And it's hugely satisfying because... With writing plays, you get huge creative control. You have ultimate control and ultimate freedom, and it's wonderful. It's very difficult, very scary, but it's good. So I've written a play, a new play about called Death at the Corporation, about a middle-aged fat has been, fun enough, who works at the BBC, who gets fired, and uh, it affects him very badly. And that should be seen sometime in the next couple of years, I hope. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank A big thank you to our guest for being the subject of another Beyond the Title interview. If you like this, why not browse the website and see if there's anything else that takes your fancy. Don't forget to like our Facebook page to receive updates of forthcoming interviews and to see more information about me and what I do. Thanks again and hopefully see you next time for another Beyond the Title interview.